for having me. I'm from Skandebanken. I am Chief Digital Officer of a digital bank, and I have been that since January. And Skandebanken, it is, at a glance, we are a fully licensed, full-fledged bank. We have close to 400,000 customers, which may sound not that much, but in a country of five million people, we are a reasonable size, but we are still a challenger, challenger bank. We have a high quality loan book. We lend money. We are into mortgages. We're into savings. We are a full-fledged retail bank. And the way we've done it is to build block by block. And I read an article in Finextra um, the other day about how banks with branches get so much more customer satisfaction than the branchless banks. Well, in Norway, it's the other way around. For 15 years in a row, our customers has been the most satisfied bank customers in the country. And not only are they the most satisfied, but we are in a different league than our competitors. So how do you manage that? How do, how do we manage to keep our customers so satisfied when we are only present in a digital space? Well, the thing about being only digital is that we have no people on the ground, we have no sales agents, we have no representatives that convince our customers into action. So we need to be transparent. There has to be no hidden fees. When Scandabank launched, um, it was before I joined, they eliminated fees on payments. There are no fees on down payments, and whatever cost there is, just like Osper said, it is very visible. So what you see is what you get. In addition, we never went all in about the cross-selling thing. We said to our customers, use the services that we have, that we do the best, and if you find something where we are not the best, use somebody else. And of course, by doing that, we need to be competitively priced at the types of products and services that we mean that should be our core business. And that's an important part, choosing what is our core business. Just like Osper, we also have partners who handles a lot of issues for us. We use the postal office for customer identification, first time customers, and so forth. But how we build our platform? Well, we see that we need one single digital platform. We don't have a lot of channels. We have one channel. It is our digital bank. It looks the same on your tablet, on your phone, on your laptop. It, it gives you instant access to everything. We also need customer support, of course. We are a self-service bank, but every once in a while you want to talk to somebody. We acknowledge that. Even though we are online only, digital only, we have a call center. We have financial advisors, but you can meet them anywhere. You have to call them. But we need to automate as much as possible. These days there's a lot of talk about RPA, robotics, and so forth. Um, for some, some banks, that's a good choice. We, we strive to automate everything we can instead of putting robots on top. But we also do that. And it is customer interaction. Listening to our customers has been the key to how we have built the bank from the very beginning. And this is the reason why people keep choosing us. This is the reason why we win awards every single year in every single category when it comes to customer satisfaction. Seeing how the clients want to use it and give the customers what they need. And the results speak for themselves. We have extremely strong growth. Our loan book is growing steady year on year, and we are just getting started. And this is where we are today. And I was hired this January to now reinvent the digital bank because the thing is, we are facing a perfect storm of changes. There's so much going on in the digital space these days that there is no way that we can just lean back and be satisfied with our past achievements. We need to take actions. We need to realize that this is not going to last forever. It's not only the technology, it's so much going on. There's so many startups out there wanting to do what we are doing, and we need to pay attention. Because the industry has not really been paying attention until fairly recently. A lot of these competitors have been building up in, um, 
in stealth mode. And there was a survey two years ago on key executives in the banking sector of which these fintech companies they've heard about. And well, you can forgive that some of these are somewhat un unfamiliar, but being an executive at a company which makes your living out of payments and saying that, well, I've heard about PayPal, but I don't really know what they do. That is unforgivable. And this is what we're facing. We see that there are, there's a fintech company for every single thing we do. It started out in payments, and you now see companies like Klarna out of Sweden, Adyen out of Amsterdam, are billion dollar companies solving problems that should have been solved by the banks, and they're expanding globally. We see that in capital markets and savings, it's the next, uh, it is the next uh, wave of fintech. We see the customers and partners of yesterday are our competitors of tomorrow. And of course, the global technology companies, they, have, they are now wreaking havoc across the telco and the media industry, and the banking sector is next. And looking at how much money is being invested in fintech, the sheer amount of money being invested in fintech, so, many, so much venture capital are being betted against the banks, billions of dollars every year. And then it's important to remind oneself that this this is money. This, these are investments with a five to seven year minimum perspective. So this is not going to topple next year. It's going to take some time. And we need to be aware of what is going on because this is like boiling, boiling a frog. Slowly this will come and take small bits and pieces of our business if we're not paying attention. And this is due to a lot more than just technology. This is a perfect collaboration of a lot of different drivers. Especially in Europe, we are used in the banking sector for the regulatory to protect us, to build extremely high barriers of entry into the financial services industry. New regulations like the Payment Service Directive 2, the new directive on uh, data privacy, is making it more difficult to be a bank and protect our industry. It is opening up to third parties through open APIs, new business models. I, s I talked about the, the converging industry players, but also the changing customer behavior. So we see that it's coming from everywhere. And looking at the technology companies, underestimating companies like Facebook, they sp spoke here in the other room earlier today in the retail um, space. And the way Facebook has become such a driving force within e-commerce, it is likely that they will do the same within banking. Just look at how Facebook have a, a license to, to perform payments in the all of Europe. They, they, they announced finally official that they, um, that they received it uh, in no December last year. And with that payment license, Facebook can do peer-to-peer -peer payments, they can do uh, they can do remittances for an exchange. And if you're creative, you can even do peer-to-peer -peer lending with that license. Fully licensed, fully compliant. And they don't really have to become a bank to challenge us. History rarely repeats itself, but it rhymes. If you look at what happened to the camera industry, and I'm not talking about Kodak, I'm talking about the digital cameras. So how many of you guys have a digital camera with you today to take pictures? Most of you probably have a camera phone. So this is an important learning for us who were a digital-only bank based in 2000. Because we were once like the digital cameras, out competing the, the traditional banks. But then suddenly something new comes. The green lines here are the sales of digital cameras globally. The orange line is the sale of iPhones. So around here, in 2008, the top year of sales, some new thing came along. And there was probably some questions going on. Will they become a bank? No, will they become a camera producer? Well, Apple never became a full-fledged camera producer, but they made the category digital compact cameras obsolete. This is the challenge we as the banks are facing the challenge of becoming obsolete by somebody coming in between us and our customer doing something, something else. Because I gotta say, being a digital bank 17 years ago, that was an easy task. 
because we were compared to going down to your local branch between 9.30 and four, uh, 3 o'clock during the day when you, you were supposed to be at work and then standing in line. Today, the customer expectation is dictated by somebody else. It's dictated by the millions of technology companies doing out there, which are excellent at doing one thing and one thing only, building great digital services. And the adoption is accelerating at a tremendous pace. If you look at the consumer adoption of new digital services, how this is shortened every time something global new phenomenon comes along, this is what we have um, in front of us. From the banking sector, the, the, most, um, the best example, especially in the Nordics, is how we looked back at how people adopted credit cards and thought mobile payments, peer-to-peer -peer payments, would take the same amount of time. It didn't. Mobile payments took really, really short time, not across all uh, payment categories, but in peer-to-peer -peer payments. And if you look at it, it goes down. For every single generation of something new, people adapt and start using it at an extremely much faster pace. And if you want to guess, Pokemon Go, how long did you think it took for Pokemon Go to reach 50 million users around a year ago? It took 10 days. But then again, who plays Angry Birds and Pokemon Go these days? Things get obsolete just as fast as, as they get adopted. And it says, this tells us that being digital is far from, it's far from sufficient to just launch an app. It's so much more than just a front, front end. Front end is what you see. And there's so much money being invested in building some kind of digital front end. But if you do not go and fix your legacy systems, go clean up the spaghetti underneath, at some point, this will be a painful experience for every bank trying to be digital. If you want to be digital, you need to be digital all the way through. Because if you have a digital-only experience, you will have so many interactions with your customer. They will try to log in so many times. And if you haven't fixed this one, what's beneath the water surface, it will fail you, I guarantee. It will go down and your customers will get furious because your bank is not working. This is the infrastructure of people's life. You're handling people's money. And this is where it gets really interesting because even for us who has been around for a while being only digital, so much, so much new technology is coming along and seeing that we can do things in a different way. Blockchain has been one of the topics here today that has been explored in um, many of um, both the panels and also the keynotes today. So I'm not gonna talk into that. But I would like to go a bit into artificial intelligence because that's one of the areas where we are investing right now. We're doing a lot of things, but since we're a listed company, I can't, fortunately can't tell you everything. But what is official is that we are going into artificial intelligence, we're going into machine learning, and we are, bu we are building a robot advisor service because we see that there are so many areas where machines, well, they have a natural advantage over us humans when it comes to banking. Because if you think about it, a lot of the jobs in banking, they are all about handling vast amounts of data, remembering so many data points, and the few decisions that are made are rule-based, and they follow strict procedures and guidelines. And doing those tasks repetitively, day in and day over, well, you might as well have machines to do it. And when we do that, we also see that we can benefit from where do the human operators have their strengths so we can get more out of our human capital. We are not many employees, we are 300 employees. So for us, this is like a gift basket of doing more with the people we have. We have financial advisors. We're not gonna fire our financial advisors when we build a robo-advisor service, but we're going to reallocate their time into spending time where their human insight have real value. And the way we do this, in the good old days, we built this service finished before we went to market. Moving ahead, we need to, do, we need to work at a different pace. We need to dare to go out to the market before something is finished. The co-founder of LinkedIn, he said, if you are not just a little bit embarrassed about your product at launch, 
you have launched too late. And this is a cultural barrier for a bank, launching something that is not finished. Of course, everything has to be in place when it comes to security compliance, but maybe the front end can look a bit scruffy just to test how the customers will respond. And this is what we're doing with our robot advisory service. We're gonna build a fairly simple service, see how it gets used, and then adjust according to how our customers respond. Because this is the part of the culture of Skanderbanken. A lot of companies these days are saying that, well, we are no longer whatever industry, we are gonna be a technology company. Well, I, I can say that Skanderbanken is the technology company that became a bank and it's inherent in our culture. So how we work is to go out there, let our customers be involved in our product development process. This is another thing we launched this year, is a beta version of our app. So for our customers, we now release new code, new features before it's finished, and also before we know if this is something that's going to be there forever. By doing this, we can get feedback on things that we are working on and seeing whether people actually use it or not. Because there's few things that's less cool than whatever app coming from a bank trying to be cool. We need to be useful. And especially when you deal in the digital world, there really are two competitive advantages. The ability to understand your customers better than your competitors and the ability to execute upon that understanding faster than whoever else has understood it. So that is what I had for you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Christopher. There's a guy. I talk to people in this market every single day about how they're trying to become a digital bank, and you're telling me there's not a single hand to go up. There we go. It's six o'clock <laughs> <laughs> on a Monday. The question I want to ask is, what, are you, what, what can't be replicated of what you've got here in this region? Because a lot of the banks, as you say, Aaron, are already starting to go down this route already. Standalone bank, or can, a re can a, an existing bank start to do what you're doing? Yeah. Um, now I'm not that familiar with how things are set up in every country in this region, but one of the main barriers of going global with fintech or digital banking is the national digital infrastructure. You are very depending on having a certain level of, of maturity in the digital infrastructure of, um, of the country you're operating in. Uh, also, it helps to have a certain penetration of cards and different forms of digital payments. Of course, uh, now the amount of cash in, um, in the Nordics, it's, it's extremely low. But even back then, car, cash was fairly high, so we needed to piggyback on a lot of other services. And we started out offering simple savings accounts and, um, and cards and payments. And it took a while before we went into the balance uh, sheet type of, uh, of revenues. So <coughs> I think there's a reason why so many challenger banks are now not focusing on the balance revenues, but are going after off-balance type of products because they are more capital light. It's difficult to build a full-fledged bank from the beginning. But then again, now there's so much attention to this space that there's so many banks out there so getting to a certain size as fast as possible, I think that is uh, um, a fairly good choice to do because this appeals to the innovators in the market. And when Skandabank launched, they were alone of appeal appealing to those innovators. If you look at the UK market, how many challenger banks do you have now? 12, 13, 15, 14? I don't know, but the addressable market for these kind of banking services when you are launching at first, it is not that big. We need, you need to have the innovators to try this out and prove it to, to the world, to, to your market, that this is viable. And this has been an important uh, driver for, for, for our, how we deal with our customers. We call them members. Our strategy is to create a word of mouth where our customers recommend us to everyone. 
uh, in their friends, their family, and so forth. And there was, um, across every industry in Norway, we were deemed number one in the company that people would recommend to their best friends to use. And this has been a strategy that has been followed for 17 years. So, um, there's no silver bullet to build a successful uh, digital-only bank. Uh, but uh, if there's one key learning, it is to stay true to your core values. Because one misstep in this game, your customers will see it through you. This is why we have never had a single hidden fee. We have never tried to cross-sell a product which our customers really do not want. And this is what has paid off over time. And this is the cultural issue that was um, mentioned uh, in the previous uh, Q&A. The culture of actually doing that, of actually saying no to some revenue streams just to maintain our image, I think that is one of the really, really key factors to our success. My question is about the uh, omni-channel. Yeah. Uh, uh, as you know better than me, the omni-channel is uh, one of the major components of uh, digital banking. My question is that uh, did you develop the, the platform of uh, omni-channel in-house in your bank or you use a, a specific platform, a ready platform? I'm not sure I, catch, I caught everything you said there. Uh, did you ask if you, if, you are, if you are using a specific platform for Omnichannel? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we don't really need Omnichannel that much because we have one channel. We have our digital bank platform, and then we have our, our call center, of course, and it's connected. So our front end, we have developed it ourselves. We have in-house developers, we've always had it. So we're not using any of the Omnichannel type of providers because uh, I think a lot of the hype around omnichannel comes from brick and mortar type of actors. And a lot of the offerings that are out there are tailored to brick and mortar actors, how to drive whatever theoretical customer journey across mobile, online, branch, call center, video chat with your sales representative and so forth. By not having all those interaction points, we have not had the need to buy an omnichannel uh, platform. Uh, the thing that we are looking into is more to leverage the customer data to make thing, things more tailored and more, more relevant. Uh, but what can be interesting for us going forward, we see that social media is getting more attention. We get a lot of customer uh, questions on Facebook, we get it on Twitter, we get it all over the place. And, the way the banks work now, we have to direct them to the official customer chat because we need, of compliance reasons, if there are complicated questions, we need to answer that in the official channels. So the next, gen next level of omnichannel where the channels are no longer something we control, that's going to be an interesting journey that we also need to take into account. I don't know if that answered your question, but this is something I'm thinking about at least. This is going to become way more complicated in the future. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, your model is uh, more about digital channel, okay? So you will find more and more challenges if you want to apply this in a less mature uh, environment. So do you consider another, uh, another way of getting maybe cash and move it inside your uh, bank, make it digital? I'm not sure I followed you. So, so, I had sort of a similar question and it will they follow. So, how much do your customers use cash? And then when they do, what do you do to kind of get rid of it? Well, we don't, we don't have any cash handling. So, ATM? No, nothing. Can't you cash out of an ATM? Well, you can use our competitor's ATMs. We have a card. So, the, the that, that's where the digital infrastructure comes into play. If you put your card in an ATM from another bank, you can withdraw cash. That's on our accounts. And we cover that charge. Okay. No one would have guessed that you don't have ATMs. <laughs> I love that. That's fine. 
Um, my question are about the part of the financing part. Okay, deposits, cash, money, that's fine. Uh, all can go digital very easily. What about the financing products which you are offering to your, to your customer, like uh, mortgages, um, cars? Uh, do you finance corporates, uh, small, medium uh, companies, and so on? Because this is where the complication really comes, and uh, and if you are able to digitize this part of the yeah. financing part, we are we are pure retail bank, so we are not financing any corporates or SMEs, uh, but we are into mortgages. We have unsecured lending, we have car lending, uh, and the source of the capital, of course, we have loans over our own balance because we are a full-fledged uh, banking license, but we also have foreign capital through co covered bonds. Uh, we collected in Nibor now, uh, and we will probably go to more expand our capital market uh, interface. Okay. So, yeah. In many sense, if you open and look under the hood, we are a traditional bank doing the traditional, um, traditional uh, balance sheet stuff uh, as well. Okay. Um, but since we are so strong on mortgages alone, this, this is fairly cheap capital, especially in Norway, because Finance through covered bonds has been like um, country standard for, for the banks, and it's, we get good pricing. Uh, mortgages and cars, for example, uh, do you digitize this process? Like if I want to buy a house, will I take a photo and send it to you? You do something and you come back to me and so on? Or I have to, you know, what is the digitization here at this point of view uh, for buying a car or buying a house? Well, for unsecured lending, if you score green on our credit scoring, it's straight through. You get your money in minutes. It's, it's how fast you type determines how fast you get your money if you have a good credit score. For mortgages, it's a bit more difficult, of course, because you have to send in your paycheck. So there are some manual steps when it comes to mortgages. Um, then there we have also the, the digital infrastructure nationally when, it's co when it comes to um, land registry where we have uh, an API to, to the government and we are also waiting for an API to the tax authorities to get the tax sheets. We will digitize it even more. So the ability to provide a pure play straight through processing digital uh, mortgage process, that's not up to the banks alone. You need to have, have, have the government uh, with you to get that. Uh, but we're getting there in Norway. And who will get there first between Norway and Sweden? I'm not sure, but one of, one of our two countries will get there first. Unless you guys are up to the challenge to beat us to it. All right, uh, so thanks, Christopher. Uh, once again, fantastic. If you want to live in the Matrix, move to Scandinavia, because you're very close to it. Uh, so thanks very much again. Yeah.